Welcome to Railway Legends, Myths, and Stories. I'm Kevin Stanley. In this episode, we will be looking back 70 years ago to the mid-20th century and the period of rebuilding after World War II. Across Europe, many countries were rebuilding their transportation networks. Often, almost nothing was left of the pre-war infrastructure. As countries were taking a long and hard look at their transportation needs, one small country took a somewhat novel approach to doing so. The small Central European country of Albonia realized that they needed a total reconstruction of their rail system. Many suggested that they look to some of the newest ideas and systems from around the world in order to build a world-class railway. However, any new system would need to meet the special requirements of the country's military logistics system. On the 1st of April, 1953, a special international group of consultants gathered to look into the design of a new transport system. The rail division of these experts were a very diverse group, and while they were above average caliber, they had very significant communications issues. Each of the consultants came from a different country, and the group did not share any common language. Furthermore, they did not share a common measurement system. A separate set of consultants worked to do the translation and to write the final reports. Needless to say, a fair number of errors tended to creep into the work. After careful study, all aspects of the new railway would be considered. At the beginning, the question of gauge came up. Elbonia had virtually no international interchange, but a plethora of pre-war gauges, from the two and three-quarter Plutus to the seven and seven-eighths Imperial Zlots broad gauge. It was a well-known problem that successive Elbonian governments switched measurement systems, leading to further confusion. Since most rolling stock had been destroyed or was, was worn out, the group decided it would be best to start over with a new common gauge for the whole country. While this is a laudable idea, this is where the consultants really took their ideas to extremes. To meet the commercial and military requirements placed on the new railroad, the decision they reached was to go to a much broader gauge. Miraculously, everybody proposed a different gauge but once they had been all cross-converted multiple times, it came out to 3,000 millimeters. Yes, you hear that right. Three meters, a very broad gauge indeed. There was some logic for this, as one of the problems that had always plagued the Elbonian railways was the country's notorious mud. It was thought that the broader gauge would help float the track. There was also the need to carry very bulky loads on the railway as the road system was and always had been in an even worse state than the railway. There was a completely different report on the canal system. We will not cover this here, but we suggest it might be an interesting topic for some others who like tracing obscure and disused canals. It was known that this very broad gauge would normally cause great trouble with curves, However, the consultants came up with an old and well-known solution. This was a golden opportunity to try it out. All new rolling stock would be equipped with split axles. The split axles would thus allow the wheels to turn at different speeds through the curves. With this innovation, the curves of the rail could be far tighter than most countries' standard gauge. What was not fully understood was that this would entail a great deal of preventative maintenance. Uh, well, that was for another day. One other problem that came up was that, though the gauge was wide, the rails that could be obtained would, would not allow heavy loading, especially for the locomotives. There was also the recurring problem of wheel slippage due to mud on the rails. A truly outside-the-box idea was put forward. It was decided that rack locomotives would be used to allow fairly light locomotives to pull long and somewhat heavy trains. Once again, communication problems came up. The Motive Power Subcommittee recommendation went out and was distributed to every other committee, but as none of them could read any of it because there hadn't been time to get it translated, and besides, they were all too busy, they trusted each other 
a tad too much. An order for the new locomotives went out to a jobber in Liechtenstein, who then passed the order on to an Icelandic forwarding agent, who led it to a plant in San Marino that subcontracted it to a Swiss manufacturer. There were more than a few errors in specifications. By the time the locomotives arrived, a great deal of the new 3-meter gauge track had already been laid. To everyone's horror, the Swiss locomotives were all 1-meter gauge. A Hungarian firm said they could make up axle extensions. These were then obtained and tried out. And while they seemed to work, they did tend to wobble badly and limited the locomotives to a speed less than walking pace. While there had been no expectation that the new system would be fast, this was a bit too much. A new set of consultants came up with a simple, but unfortunately expensive solution. While buying new locomotives might have been less expensive, there was no budget remaining for locomotives, but there was plenty in the rail budget. So two additional rails were laid between the three meter rails, including the center rack. This became the now famous five rail Elbonian standard. The locomotive working group created new problems. All along, the plan had been to electrify the entire rail network. Unfortunately, nobody had consulted with the Elbonian National Power Network. It soon became clear that there was no way that the country's feeble power grid could ever provide enough power for the new rail system. Besides, due to an oversight, nobody had budgeted for overhead wire and related infrastructure. Although the high voltage transformers had been ordered and were now sitting around collecting rust. However, the meter gauge rack locomotives had also arrived and were rigged to run on electricity. Fortune came to the project from an unexpected direction. A new consultant group worked out a process to use some of the railway's old steam locomotives whose wheels would be removed with the engines mounted on some of the new 3 meter gauge flat cars. These engines were coupled to low voltage generators. Then, using another flat car to carry a mobile substation and using the already purchased transformers, these rolling power plants turned out to be able to power the Swiss locomotives adequately. While the technical problems had been overcome and the trains could now run, a major operational issue appeared. The trains now had to have two crews, the electric locomotive crew and the steam engine crew. While the steam engines were mounted on flat cars, old union crew rules required a full crew. While the extra crew was a cost drag, the real problem was that the steam crews were senior in service. As they were the senior crew, they claimed to be in operational control of the train. The electric locomotive crews claimed that as their engines were what was actually making the train move along the tracks, they should be in operational control. This operations issue has never been fully resolved and has led to trains being stopped when the two engine crews have gotten into fistfights over who was actually in charge of the train. In the future, perhaps, I will go into the other problems plaguing Elbonian railways, one of which was the central dispatch of all trains. The lack of any reliable communication system meant that the railways had to fall back on trying to integrate the old Imperial Pigeon Corps. This has not been a real success for use in controlling train movements as the birds tend to land on the pantographs, which are still connected to the locomotive's electrical system. <sighs> and as always, we'll see you on the train, but probably not an Albonian one.